afternoon, wherever you are, or evening for Kevin most especially. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank the United Board for inviting me to be part of this panel and to share some things that we've been thinking about in the Ateneo de Manila University. So as I mentioned earlier in my introduction, I'm from Ateneo de Manila. Uh, I got a picture of our campus because I, I miss it. It's been a while since we've been back. Uh, as mentioned, we're a population of 10,000 from K-12 to to higher education. And I just want to quickly move into what we've been doing over the past few months. So for, I think for a lot of you, as mentioned by Kevin earlier, the shift has been quite drastic or quite rapid. Uh, and it goes the same for Ateneo. So the screenshots that I took here in this slide uh, begins to illustrate what our first few weeks when we went into quarantine looked like. So it was a series of trainings, just like what Dr. Wong mentioned, a series of trainings for faculty uh, on the learning management systems that they've been using. So for Ateneo, uh, teachers currently use a couple of different learning management systems. So we had to identify which ones are more commonly used and we had to set up trainings for people to have some options as to where they can set up their online classroom. So in Ateneo de Manila University, when you talk about the faculty, it's really a mix of people who might have more advanced experience or more uh, years of experience even in online learning uh, to people who have not even set up any sort of learning management system at all. So it's a range of things that we tried to deal with in the first few weeks. But I wanted to show this slide uh, just to point out that what was interesting about this phenomenon in, is in as much as a lot of the initial questions were about setting up the technicalities of things, uh, people quickly moved to conversations about how we can make effective learning happen. Uh, and I think that's what I'd like to focus on uh, in my quick presentation. So the presentation is entitled Refocusing on Learning in an Online Learning Environment because uh, one of the things that we found helpful over the past few months uh, is that we've had more conversations with colleagues about what we want learning to look like. Uh, and I think that's quite valuable because when we begin to converse about these things, to move away from focusing on just the tools that uh, are to be used, but to really focus on the core of what we hope to happen. Um, maybe just to say as a caveat that much like a lot of the universities probably present here, uh, we're still also figuring things out. We're still also finalizing our plans for the coming school year. Uh, so hopefully the next few ideas will help you think about uh, what the classroom might look like in your case. So uh, I often like starting with a question because I think questions begin to frame conversations. So. Uh, I know that a lot of you shifted to online learning. So an interesting question that you might want to begin to think about yourselves before I move on to my presentation is just to remember what online distance learning looked like or fe felt like for your students uh, in the past few months as you shifted. Or if you're st still currently in session, uh, what do you think does it look and feel like for your particular students? Uh, I think that when we want to design effective online learning environments, it's important to begin with thinking about what that experience looks like. Uh, and that's where these memes come in. Uh, I tried to look for memes that people passed around when people shifted to online learning. And you'd see a lot of these common things popping out. Uh, and when you look at these particular memes, uh, one of the common things that we now begin to realize or that we began to realize when we quickly shifted is that a lot of the structures that are in place that put together what education is, what teaching and learning looks like, uh, most especially for our students, uh, have now disappeared. Um, a lot of the physical things that, are, that they're very much used to, a lot of the routines uh, are now suddenly absent. And one of the absences that is most disturbing to us and in a lot of conversations this has been mentioned is really the absence of the teacher. Uh, I say it in quotation marks because obviously in the next few minutes we hope to begin to dispel this absence and we hope to begin to think about how we still might be present. Uh, even in asynchronous learning environments, wherein physically what often happens is students learn on their own, so to speak. So our driving question for the next few minutes is as follows. How might we design for teaching presence? Uh, in the Ateneo Salt Institute, in, in assisting the university to shift to online learning, and as we assist the university and the faculty uh, in looking into what the next few months might look like, uh, what we've really been trying to do is trying to think about the design principles that we can keep in mind as we move forward. So allow me to share with you some design principles and some examples, uh, specifically from my classroom, not to say that they're absolutely the best examples, but just to get you thinking about the possibilities in your classroom as well. Sorry about that. That's my two-year-old kid, the perils of online teaching. So just today, fine. 
<laughs> I'd like to frame my, my quick presentation into three things uh, that we can design to design our teaching presence in the classroom, even in an online environment, through looking at three particular aspects, designing content, uh, designing for a cohort, and designing as a coach. So allow me just to dip into these three basic concepts in the next few minutes. So designing content is quite um, straightforward. For a lot of us, uh, moving into online learning is really about initially curating and creating content for students to interact with. Uh, but the danger here, and I think Dr. Wong mentioned this danger a while ago, is uh, to, to move towards an information dump type of teaching, wherein you just put your PowerPoints there and then you just assume that students will learn on their own. So I think the keywords here when you talk about designing content is really to design meaningful interaction uh, where that, that will facilitate learning. So in as much as, for example, we ask students to read, but then our discussion really begin to frame the reading and synthesize the reading or the content that you've asked them to go through, I think that we have to bring this, this kind of sensibility into online teaching as well. Now, learning sciences and a lot of research on education would say a lot of things about it, but uh, one way of simplifying it is just to look at these three things that uh, we'll try to look into, to activate from context, to connect to content, and to evaluate, to validate. So activating from context is really one of the basic things that we learn in education school. Uh, the importance of being able to tap into students' prior knowledge and experience and students' current situation and current environment as part of your teaching. This assumes that you assume that students bring something with them in the learning experience and they're not an empty shell for you to fill in. So this is an example from my class. Uh, I was teaching about prototyping and I realized that uh, I've been giving exercises that are too abstract and detached from the current reality. So one of the things I tried out is to have them imagine or prototype a post-COVID scenario. So if you can see the screenshot over here, they can choose between imagining a post-COVID restaurant, a post-COVID dating scene, a post-COVID school, or a post-COVID office. Uh, and they enjoy this particular exercise and they had very interesting insights. And I think that was because uh, we, we started to begin to talk about the context, no? uh, that the subject matter did not become detached from the context that they're in right now. A second strategy that I found helpful in online teaching is to connect to content. Uh, Content is king for a lot of us, right? Uh, a lot of us would say that and content delivery is one of the defaults in terms of instruction in higher education, most especially. Uh, but we can learn a lot from what learning scientists are beginning to tell us about how to actually present content effectively. Uh, and here are some examples that when we talk about content, hopefully we shift from merely presenting content to thinking about how we can connect to content. And I think this is very important, most especially in asynchronous scenarios wherein students will be going through content that you create uh, on their own. Uh, here are some examples like uh, giving relevant examples, interesting metaphors, student experiences, and intriguing situations. Uh, I'd just like to quickly run through, you, run through with you some of the screenshots that I have here. Uh, on your left side, the screenshot with a pink box, um, that is a text-based lecture that I created for my class. Uh, this was a response based on my survey among students because when we shifted to online learning, I had to find out the level of connectivity of my students. And what I found out is that there were one or two students who had trouble with connectivity. So uh, because of those one of one, one or two students, I decided to lessen our synchronous discussions and for a while really eliminated it um, in my classes. So what I tried to do is I tried to think of more low bandwidth sort of solutions. And what I tried out here on the screenshot on the left is a text-based lecture. So I basically just wrote my text, typed in my text, uh, but I, I wanted it to be an interactive experience. So I tried to use Google Documents and within the text of the lecture, I would call out on students. So it's like a virtual call out. So if you can see the screenshot, I call on very specific students. So for example, Luis, Jamie, Mario, Lance, what do you, th what do you think about this? So um, a couple of students were able to go through this uh, exercise and I like uh, that how I like their feedback that after going through this exercise, uh, they said that they felt like they were in an actual class again, no? uh, despite it being purely text based. The screenshot on the right, I think, is just a reminder that uh, in terms of connecting to content, it's important to keep your teacher voice or the personality of your teacher voice intact. No? Um, I am a teacher who likes relating personal experiences when I teach about particular concepts. So the screenshot you see here is of a short video uh, I made part of my text-based lecture of my three-year-old son, Asher. So I, I often include him in my lectures and students know that Asher is a character that comes out in my lectures. And so I continue to do that. Uh, to have some semblance of that conversation with students 
uh, and to have some semblance of your personality as a teacher. So uh, if you're a teacher who would like to say some jokes, among other things, of course, we don't overdo it. Uh, feel free to continue to do it because I think that will help them hear the voice of the teacher, so to speak, which is very important in distance learning. The last strategy is to evaluate to validate. Uh, Dr. Wong already talked about lengthily about the importance of assessment uh, and imp the importance of assessment for learning, most especially in an online learning scenario. This is where we create opportunities for students to practice, apply, to document, and of course for us to provide feedback on uh, what they've been doing. Uh, the example I'd like to show you is just to challenge what we often think of in terms of activities in online learning. More often than, than not, when we think of activities to ask students to do, we think of screen time. We think of things that they'll be doing as they type or click and work, uh, work on the screen. But I think that this particular example proves otherwise, that activities need not be on-screen activities all the time. So in the screenshot I'm showing you, this is a module on brainstorming. Uh, for my visual thinking class and I had students go through five different brainstorming strategies So when you go into one of the strategies I'll give some instructions about what the strategy is and I'll have them work on things like paper or found objects And I'll simply just have them take pictures to document their exercise and post it uh, in our class forum So maybe just to remind everyone that when we brainstorm about activities It, it need not always be on-screen activities no? So activities can be things that they do outside the screen. In fact, if you could think about how to maximize their current learning environment of the home and things that they have uh, out there, uh, that would be great. That would help them relate to the lesson a little more. So uh, designing for content is really about being mindful of the student experience of working with content and not just giving them access to content. Moving on to the second C. The second C is about cohort. Uh, in face-to-face -face teaching, we talk a lot about collaboration and the importance of creating interaction among learners. And I think it, it goes the same for online learning, that as we go through things as a cohort, as a class, it's important not just to have conversations between teachers and students, but to promote conver conversations among students as well. So here are just some examples I've, I've seen in my class, and I've seen that there are similar examples in other classes as well in Ateneo. Uh, this is a Google slide video group presentation. So uh, I had my students do group presentations about particular topics in pairs, and they basically used Google Slides, they built the slides together, and if you can see the, the icon of the speaker there, that's an audio insert where they discuss parts of the slides. So uh, it's an interesting form format uh, as an alternative to a live uh, presentation because here you hear the students' voices explaining uh, parts of the slides as well as you would uh, in a live presentation. And when I, when I saw this and when I saw my students doing this, uh, I really appreciated it because it hearing the voices of your students is, is quite interesting. It's an inter interesting experience. Um, and it, it begins to bridge the gap uh, that people might feel in online learning, wherein they, they feel sometimes like they're just reading or learning from a screen. So it, it gives some humanity into the exchange that uh, happens in an online learning situation. Uh, if you can see some blue-green slides, that's actually me. So when students submitted the slides, I had to insert myself occasionally to process some things or to fill in the gaps, as you would uh, in an online, in a physical uh, or face-to-face -face presentation as well. So these things are still possible in an online learning scenario. Of course, a more low bandwidth or low tech way of going about it is just to make sure that uh, in terms of cohort, you provide opportunities for students to interact with each other, even in discussion boards. So in this particular example, I have them read a particular document. Uh, the number one answer is an analogy that they come up with based on their reading. And then the second uh, entry that you see there is a question that they ask them to post about the reading. And instead of me replying to everyone, I ask the students to reply to at least one person in the class to try to try to address some of the questions or clarifications that their classmates actually uh, raised. So I found this quite interesting because, well, number one, the students do part of your work. So you share your work with your students. Uh, but more than that, you also get to see how they clarify each other's understanding, which I think is a very important part of the learning process. Now, the last C I'd like to introduce to everyone uh, this morning, in the Philippines at least, is to to think of yourself as a coach in an online learning scenario, to deliberately discern your presence and interventions to make sure that uh, the instructor or the teacher is present in one way or another. Uh, I'll share with you some examples on how to do this. So the most basic example I've seen across different online learning environments is basically just making sure that you give feedback in discussion boards. Um, 
in a book I recently read, uh, one of the things that, that, that the author said is that when you shift to online learning, you have to begin to realize that these things is as important as providing content to your students. Uh, and one concrete tip that, that the book actually mentions uh, is that before you start the SEM, you create a routine for yourself as a teacher. So for example, uh, you create a routine wherein every Friday you will read through the discussion boards and then you will make sure that you spend an hour commenting. So in as much as you want students to schedule their learning time, I think there is some sense to making um, sure that you also schedule your feedback time uh, to make sure that you're able to provide that to students. Uh, I know how difficult this is, most especially for large classes. There are other strategies um, to, to do it more effectively, but at the very least, one simple strategy is to be able to schedule it to make sure that you're able to do it. Um, another thing though about being a coach is not just to be an instructional coach, and I think this is quite important. Uh, what happened over the quarantine period is that I started to create modules and then at some point in time I realized that um, student participation has gone down drastically. So what I did was I just stopped creating modules for a while and then I set an online meeting on Facebook Messenger where my students are usually are um, just to check up on them. And, and this was a genuine effort on my part just to find out where they are. So uh, what's interesting was at least more than half of my class joined this uh, Facebook Messenger chat uh, and we had a good exchange. And what was interesting was for this education class that wherein I did this, uh, we, sh we quickly transi transitioned from how you are or how you've been doing to uh, what are the issues of education in, in this, this time of crisis. So we had a very good discussion, in fact. Uh, and this really surprised me because we started quite personal, but we moved on to something that actually moved towards the learning outcomes of, of my course itself. So I think checking up on students on a personal, personal level is important, uh, I think more than ever, uh, because sometimes some of them really can't participate in the classes for one reason or another. And when you, even when you think about cognitive load, uh, worrying about the situation in the country, in their homes, in society, uh, can really take much of an effort and uh, help and can, can be a hindrance for them to focus on what you want them to focus on. So when we think about these three C's, I think that uh, when we consider designing with these three C's in mind, content cohort and coach, we can really begin to design our teaching presence despite the mere physical absence of the teacher. But I'd like to close my presentation with adding a fourth C, uh, which is context. And I think adding this fourth C is quite relevant uh, to our situation right now, to be able to recognize what's different in the context of our students' learning experiences at the moment. That classrooms are now any room, no? that that's your students can be learning in the bedroom, in the kitchen, in the dining area, or in a combined space if they have a small space in their home and they really ha don't have a lot of rooms that they can work with. Uh, students are, instead of attending classes, which is what they usually do, they're now asked to study content. And a lot of the studying content is a self-study mode. Um, and instead of class schedules, they now have a list of tasks and deadlines to manage. So it's a very different context for students as well. And I think it's important to be cognizant of this changing context. And so maybe an invitation, and we've, we've started to begin to talk about this, is to shift our questions about online learning to questions from translation, meaning um, how do I do what I do in face-to-face -face in an online learning environment, to questions that move more to transformational questions um, from keeping things normal or using the expectations in a quote-unquote normal environment in an online, serving, uh, online learning environment to recalibrating these expectations in this new reality. And I think this is quite important because um, we don't want to be frustrated. Uh, we all want to make a strong effort to make sure that effective learning happens uh, from, uh, with our students despite the limitations and uh, of, of online learning, but instead of looking at the limitations, I think moving to transformation allows us to shift our conversation to looking at the possibilities uh, of online learning as well, no? uh, given that this might be the new default at least for the next few months. I'd like to end with uh, something that is actually thrown around uh, in Jesuit institutions, uh, and uh, I found a similar quote online a few days back. Uh, the quote says, in the rush to return to normal, use this time to consider which parts of normal are worth rushing back to. Uh, in Jesuit institutions, we also um, say this Latin proverb a lot that says, non multa sed multum, uh, which really means not many but much. So I think as an educator, um, the invitation maybe is to, is to consider this, uh, not many but much, that when we design for learning to happen, uh, most especially in the coming months, 
maybe we can consider looking at much. We can consider looking at how we can create powerful experiences uh, rather than just merely translating or putting everything that we've been doing in a face-to-face -face setting in an online environment.